So, pretty common question we ask about people when we come to know them, acquaintances, whether we meet them at work or wherever. Deep in our heart, we want to know are they the real deal. I got a mare, she's a uh, registered athlete. And from a distance, she's often mistaken as a red roan portable. Because she's got the head for it, she's got the build for it, she's got the hind end for it, she's brought in the front. She looks like a quarter horse, and with her color, she looks like a red roan. She's a pretty animal. So a lot of times that people just walk in by taking a glimpse at her and see her in the past and says, well, that's, that's a pretty red roan. Some other people make that same mistake because they don't know how to identify the difference between an apple and They don't notice them spots around her mouth or around her eyes. It's a dead giveaway that she's got out there. A friend of mine bought a horse one time for his wife from a horse trader. Here we go, right? Never trust a politician or a horse trader is what I always heard. But in, in those rounds, not always or all of them, but just a few give all of them a bad name. That's some good people trading horses and that's some good people in politics. Never mind that. Anyhow, he bought his wife this horse. Beautiful gray horse. And he said it's a registered quarter horse. And at first glance, from a distance, I buy it. But when you get up there and get to rubbing on it, you see them spots around his mouth, around his eyes. I said, buddy, I hate to break the knees to you. Beautiful animal, but it ain't no water horse. Oh, yes, it is. I got papers on it. The man said so. I said, well, the man can tell you anything he wants to. Now, I don't doubt you got papers. But those papers don't go with that horse. It can't. It's impossible. Because those papers are telling you that that horse is something that is clearly not. Have you ever met people at first first time you met them, you thought, man, I, I love that person. That's, that that fellow's cool, or that lady's cool. I like him, right? I can see us becoming good friends. And on down the road, you start to realize, oh, that person ain't who I thought it was. Matter of fact, I don't even want to be around that person. And then there's people that uh, you meet and think, man, I just really don't like that dude's attitude at all. I, I don't like it. But say you're forced to be around that person, and the more you get around that person, the more you realize, you know what? That person ain't as bad as I thought, I thought they were. On the surface, they're a little rough, but that is a good person, and I enjoy their company. Everybody with me? Are you the real deal? Now, I've tried several ways to shrink the scripture down where it wasn't so much reading and following along, but they just ain't no way to do it. I tried every way I could, and this, it is what it is. And this is the message the Lord put on my heart. But I want you to realize this morning, as you ask yourself this question, am I the real deal? Here's a telltale sign. It ain't spots around your mouth, around your eyes. Is it? <laughs> Does your life glorify God? That's the question you've got to get down to because that's what a hoop meets the dirt right there. If you want to know who you are in Christ, you can get past all the church going. You can get past all the money giving. You can get past all the so-called serving. You can get past all that and cut right down to the meat of the thing. If your papers are real, if who you are is what you say you are, you can always figure that out by one thing. Does your life glorify God? Is my intention, is my heart's moving, ever how bad you're coming up short, do I want, is it a desire of mine, is my greatest desire to bring glory to God? When Jesus came down here on this earth, he had one job, and that's to bring glory to God. Yeah, through righteousness, yeah, through being perfect, ultimately he would die on the cross. But all through the Gospels, you're going to find out that he had one job, and that was to be obedient to God, do what God told him to do, which ultimately bring glory to God. It's going to make a circle. Jesus brought glory to God, God brought glory to his son. Me and you, through a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are to bring glory to God. God makes that circle to bring glory to us. Now, that's not to put us up on no pedestal, but when people see God and they experience the love of God through a relationship with you, and they see that person's life, as it might be sometimes, that person is glorifying God with who they are. It brings glory to you. Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> Starting in verse 37. Does your life glorify God? When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went. And he went in and reclined at the table. 
But the Pharisee noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. He was surprised. The Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, you clean the outsides of your cup and dish, but the inside you are all full of greed and wickedness. Now you think about that. He said he goes, sits down at the table, and Jesus is doing his own thing, and, and the Pharisee has a thought. They know where in there where it says he questioned Jesus or he made a comment. So he has a thought. You know what? It's supposed to be the Son of God. He ain't cleaning up. How are we on rules and regulations, everybody? <laughs> this person don't follow that rule. Oh, they can't be right with God. This person don't fit this box. Oh, they can't be right with God. Look at them. Well, if that's the case, ain't none of us going to be right with God. So Jesus knows a man's mind. He knows his heart. I don't care how well you hide it from everybody or how well I hide it. God knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. And here's the deal. He knows your motives for what you do. A parrot can talk, but he can't chew gum. It don't matter what we say so much as it's what's in our heart. What is our heart's motives and why do we do what we do? Because that's where God's after. And when we unpack this, He just keeps hitting us on our rules and regulations and our doing and our, hey, y'all look at me. Hey, look at what I can do. Hey, look at what I can accomplish. And He always brings it back to the same spot, the heart. Look at here. You're going to have to excuse me. My science is bad this morning. He said, uh, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? All right, now he's geared toward the heart. But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clear for you. What's he talking about? When God is in mind in your heart, he's telling you if your motives are right, and you've got a pure heart, and you give in the name of God, that brings glory to God. Because see, he accused them of not worried about what was on the inside. Greed is selfishness, and wickedness is wrong motives. The reason I know that because he's fixing to unpack all these wrong motives they got. And some of these is going to get home with me and you. God's concerned about the heart. Look at verse 42. Well, to you Pharisees, because you give a tent of your men, you give root and all of the kinds of garden herds, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. And this right here be tough. He says, you, you going to church, you, you doing the rule thing, you giving a tenth to your money, you even serving beyond your money, and, and, and a lot of times people think, well, I'm doing this. I'm good with God. Well, I gave this to the church. I'm doing good. Well, I offer this to God, too. And they think they're all right. Here's what he says. This is, this is where he, he gets back to the heart. You neglect justice. And the love of God. I'm going to bring this a little bit closer to home to you because it comes a little closer to home to me. How do we neglect justice? We try to be righteous people. We try to do the right thing the right way. And, you know, here's where, here's where it comes home right here. If my wife lies, cheats, or steals, but because she's my wife, I make excuses for her. But let your wife do it. There's something wrong with it. That's wrong. You take my youngin, for instance. If, if my youngin is disobedient, if she gets out there in the world and she's living a life uh, that I know don't honor God, I can make all kinds of excuses for her. And we will, won't we? This, this means yes. We do. We make excuses for her. And we say, well, you know it ain't really their fault. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pits of hell. And I'm going to tell you why. This is why. Because God says for us to honor justice. That means God's word, God's wisdom, no room for me and you to tweak it and turn it depending on who it's going to affect in our life. But we do that and we wonder why our, our life don't glorify God. We wonder why all this torment of the world is coming down on us. We wonder why we live and look just like the people out there that don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior because we're doing what they do. They don't honor justice and they don't honor the love of God. What is the love of God? The love of God is doing the right thing the right way according to what this Word says. Not what I say. Not what the book says. Not what them folks believe or want you to believe. It's about this Word right here. And if you neglect justice, making excuses for people that you're supposed to be in your realm of influence, when you bring honor and glory to God and those people in your realm of influence, realm of influence they see you doing the right thing the right way, it makes them say, hmm, there might be something wrong with what I'm doing. Because my daddy won't be in. 
My mama won't bend. Here we go. We love ours more than we love God. I'll tell you how I know that's true. Because if I protect, excuse, condone my wife, my family, my friend, whoever, if I condone what I know is sin in God's eyes, I'm saying, I love you more than I love God. And I'm going to bend my life to you because I'm not going to bend it to God. And that sounds hard, but I'm telling you, that is the love of God. The love of God is do the right thing the right way. Line yourself up under this word. Be obedient to God. That's what Jesus did. He bent his life to be right here. Now, I don't know where you are this morning, but every one of us has got to ask ourselves the question, am I the real deal? Does my life honor God? Or am I continuously bending it because I don't want to offend nobody? I, I'm going to bend it because I don't want my young man or my wife to be mad at or my husband to be mad at. I'm going to bend it because I don't want to cause trouble in my family. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'll go along with this because if I stand up for what's right, you know they ain't going to like it. I'm just saying, that's what the Word says. Verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greet in the marketplace. Well, what is he talking about? We love power and status. We like to be in control. And, and we like folks to know we're in control. And, and when we come up to a whatever, we keep seeking that higher spot above that person, above that person. When my mind and my heart is, is geared towards I want the best, I want to be better than these folks. I deserve better than that person. That don't bring honor and glory to God. That's you working on your own mission to get what you want the way you want it. So it, it, again, it takes God out. It, it takes the power. Let me ask you like this. What is the effect of your salvation on the people in your life? What is the effect of your salvation on the people in your life? Because if who you are don't bring honor and glory to God, how are they going to know that you're supposed to bring honor and glory to God? If you keep bending your life to not rock the boat or not cause problems or to look good or to be the first or to be the best or be way up here lofty and thought of as I got this and I'm all that, the effect of your salvation defines how you glorify God. Watch this right here, verse 45. Here's what happens when we get called out. And by the way, I'm not calling you out. This is God's word. It ain't mine. I got called out for you, did. I've been working on this since last Sunday. So I've been to the woodshed a bunch of times. Verse 45. The ex one of the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you are insulting us also. Now, for him to say, when, he, when you say it is, you're not only insulting the Pharisees, you, which he was a Pharisee, you're insulting us too. What's he saying? I don't like that preacher. I don't like what you're saying because it's taking the power away from me. It's taking my, it's, it's making me challenge my motives, and it's causing me to look at something other than what I say is right, other than what I say is God, other than how I want to live my life. He's mad. How many times somebody ever called you out deep down in your heart? You knew they was right. You did your teeth and make you mad. Or women. You can say yeah, because every one of us has been there. I've been called out and knowing I was wrong, but I sure don't like it when folks go to point out my wrongs. Right? That's what was going on here. Why has that happened? Because when I got offended, when my wife told me, Jimmy, that's wrong, and you know that's wrong, and I get mad about it, it may take me a little while to come back around and say, maybe I'm going to be right. <laughs> I but what's going on here? I'm saying my pride is so big I'm going to make you believe I'm right when I know I'm wrong. I'm going to fight you until one of us quits, and I hope it's you. Right? That's why these arguments are ready to jump. This, this Pharisee, this law expert, and when he says expert of law, he was good at doing it too. He was offended because Jesus is poking at his heart. Not what he's doing right, but what he's not doing. He's poking at the heart. Their life brought glory to them. It made them look good. They obeyed the law. They knew all the rules. And they fit in the box. And they looked good on paper. But Jesus keeps poking at the heart. That's what He's doing to me. He's poking at the heart. It don't matter. When you, when you come of age and you, and you 
got the responsibility of your own life. You can't be blaming mom and dad. Well, that's the way I was raised. So, be your own person now. You got to title that community. You decide whether your life's going to bring honor and glory to God. They was all about religion, and they rejected Christ. Look here, verse 46. Jesus replied, <clears throat> And you experts of the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift a finger to, to help them. What's he saying? He's saying you can be better with it. I'm telling you, this is what happens in our families right here. Parents are notorious for this. This is what parents do. They make this list of rules and regulations, and they will be bent to make their kids fit in that box. And when their kid don't fit in that box, oh, it's on now. You ever seen them take a car to school up in there? That's where they get. That's the reason we get all crazy and wide-eyed and go to stomping and fussing and ranting and raving when our kids don't fit in that box because we're being Pharisees. I'm more worried about the effect you're going to have when people looking at you don't think about me. They're going to think I didn't raise you better than that when I did. We're more worried about ourselves than we are our kids. Listen to me now. Whenever I'll take God's Word and I'll make it a box you've got to get in, and if you don't get in that box and you ain't right with me and you ain't right with God and you condemned and all that stuff, we put them in a place. And I did this to J.D. one time. I had me a nice little box. And when she was real little, it was easier to keep her in. I could keep her in that box. That's all I had. What do we do? How do we do things here? How do we do things here? And for a long time, she fit in that box real good. And then she got to be a teenager. Teenagers ain't crazy. They ain't mean. They're trying to find their way. But we try to force another human being that we don't have control or power over, let's say in our sight. We try to force them in that box. We create a wall of separation between us and them. And when you create that wall and you separate them, you have lost your realm of influence. And here's what we do. We start excusing. Well, that ain't really her fault. That's going back to this other verse up here, neglecting judgment. And we don't love them well because we keep condoning. We keep trying to bend the rules so my young man don't look so bad. We bend the rules because my lifestyle don't look so bad. We twist this thing around till it was messed up as I am. I'm really ain't all that bad because I'll just look at that and that and that and that. That works for me. Right? Here's what he said. He said, y'all put these rules and regulations on people. We put rules and regulations on our kids until they just cannot live up to them. Jay messed up one time. She lied to them. I hate a liar. Because once you, once you break that, that trust, it's hard to get it back. I'm not talking about a misconception. I'm talking about a bald-faced liar. And so we had a little family meeting. We were sitting down there on the couch. And she looked me dead in the eye. And she said, Daddy, you have made this so hard. It was easier for me to lie than it was for me to tell you that I, I messed up. I said, she's turning that around on me. She's blaming me for her mistake. Ain't that what it looks like? It's what it felt like. Because in the flesh, being a Pharisee, I said, this is the box and you got out of it. It's your fault. I didn't want to take responsibility, but I made that box so impossible she had to be perfect to stay in it when she got out of it. She was condemned. Her heart was so broken she had to lie to me. I'm not condoning the lie. I know why she did it. Because I made it so hard on her. It was easier to lie than it was to tell the truth. None of us are going to fit in that box of Pharisees to me. It takes God's grace and His mercy for every one of us. Every day we come up short. Now you may not see my faults and I may not see yours, but they're there. The question is, do I want to bend my life to glorify God? I want to keep putting my life in this box and changing the box where it looks, it looks like I'm going to get out of it. Look, look on down here. Lord, to you because you built tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify, now there's several meanings to this, but we're going to get to a point right here. You testify that you approve of what the forefathers did. Why? Because you go along with it. When there's wrongdoing in our life and our family and our friends and we condone it, we go along with it. We don't stand for what's right. We don't, we don't line ourselves up under God. You condone it, therefore you say it's okay. Whatever it is. 
when you don't stand on the side of righteousness, when you don't go back up here, when you neglect justice and the love of God, when it's more about that box than it is my heart and my heart's motives and loving the Lord, then I approve it. Therefore, I condemn what is right. I, I say I, don't, I ain't going along with that. Because it's harder for me to, like me, it, it, it's harder for me to stand on the truth because of the wreck it's going to cause. So I'll just go along with it and make it all right. Jump over to 52. We'll get you closer. What are you experts of the law because you have taken away the key to the knowledge? What is the key to knowledge? You yourselves have not entered. And you have also hindered those who were entering. What is the key to knowledge? Key to this word. The only way me and you gonna ever figure this out is through salvation of Jesus Christ. Because it's the Spirit of God that gives us wisdom. Now you can go online, you can look up Bibles, verses, and you can look up sermons, and you can preach somebody else's sermon, and it can be all that and be dead on. But it has no real power. The read you ever read the devotional and ten minutes later, I'm ready, you don't you ain't got no clue what it said. The reason you don't have a clue what it said because it never got to the heart. It never got past this. It never got to you, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to do a devotional. So I did my devotional. Now I get to move to the next step. Are you with me? The reason it had no power, the reason it had no value, is because it never got to your heart. Is your heart to glorify God this morning as a born again believer in Christ? Are you the real deal? Because I'm afraid a lot of times, myself included, we as Christians, we are registered, so to speak. We have salvation. We are the real deal. But over here, we look like an Appaloosa. The reason we look like an Appaloosa is because we don't follow that word right there. And then there's some of you out here this morning, unfortunately, you got papers. You think you registered, but you ain't. You just horse over here that don't belong to the papers. You might have a piece of paper, you might have a baptism. You might have walked an aisle, and I'm not trying to get anybody to question their salvation. I'm just saying there's two kinds of people on this earth. There are those that portray themselves to be Christians and are not, and there are those that that are Christians but don't live like it. Look right here what he said. He said, You got the key to knowledge, but because you live like the Pharisees, you're a stumbling block to people that, that, that need Christ. And the reason we become a stumbling block, and I'm going to tell you something. A lot of us are stumbling blocks to our children. They don't want nothing to do with God. So this this list of rules. It has no love. It has no grace. You gotta look like this, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do that. You can't do this, and you can't do that. I believe I'm done too. That's all this is about. God's concerned about your heart. Look at verse 53. He said, "Are you the real deal, or is your life?" stumbling block to others because it don't glorify God. I can give you, I mean, we're going all day about Scripture in the New Testament that talks about we're supposed to be good things to glorify God. Verse 53. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and, and began to besiege to the questions, wanting to catch him in, some, in something that, that he might say. What they was trying to do, they were bombarding the questions. How many times have you ever tried to share Christ with somebody and, and here, here we go, I don't want that God thing you got, so I'm just going to keep asking you questions and I'll find questions you can't answer and I'll start to nitpick your wall because you ain't no more perfect than I am, Mr. Holier than thou. Close your Bible and quit preaching to me. Everybody been there? If you ain't, it's because you ain't shared Christ with nobody. That's just God's honest truth. He said that they turned around and started attacking him. And the reason they attacked him because they want to defend their way of life. They want to defend their rules and regulations because they don't want to give their heart to Christ. And I'm, I'm honest. That's my Bible this morning. That's your Bible this morning. Salvation. I'm going to say something right now. Some of you know it's going to hit you close. Listen to me closely. Salvation is not the goal. What do you think about that? Salvation is not the goal. Here's how I know. Because when God created man, he didn't need salvation because he was right with God. It's when man and woman chose to eat that fruit and be disobedient with God. Now, all of a sudden, they've taken their stuff out of God's plan and His will and His purpose. Because when God created man, He had a beautiful garden. 
He had to ramble the earth. He got the name, the name of the animals. He was in charge of everything. The one thing God told him to do was not to eat that tree. He defied God in his heart. I know better than God. We let Satan talk him into it. I'm telling you something. Satan ain't talking nobody into nothing they don't want to do start with. Is that right? Salvation is not the goal. In the beginning, we didn't need salvation. When Adam and Eve sinned, now we've got to be reconciled to God. Salvation is the means to the goal. When Adam and Eve was put here, they were put here to bring glory to God, to honor God, to glorify God. That's what we're here for, people. To bring glory to God. Not build churches and do church services and build this little box of rules and regulations, check them off every week. I did this, 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 and that. Oh, I gotta go back and check that box. We are put here to glorify God. In John chapter 11, when Jesus that came married the one that Magdalene and tried to cry, wash his feet with her hair and perfume, dry her perfume. They came to Jesus and said, Your friend Lazarus has died. If he don't hurry, he's gonna die. You said, ah, he didn't die. Well, he did die. What did it take? Three days for him to get there? But Jesus spoke and he came back to life. Now, what does that say? He said that this needed to happen. This bad thing. You know, these bad things that we try to fix. We go around God's will and purpose to try to change. These bad things that are wrong in our life that we, we gather the truth, get our little Christian friends together, and we fix this problem or we make this problem go away or we do away with these people because they're causing problems. That's what was going on there. Jesus said, this is a good thing. Because if you just trust me and you let me bring glory to my Father, I'll bring glory to you and I'll make him come back to life. We don't get to experience God healing us and changing us and, 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 and bringing us into the glory light of God because we're too busy fixing it, changing it, getting rid of it, right? Jesus said, I'm suppo He's supposed to be there where I can work a miracle and I can glorify my Father in heaven. My Father in heaven is going to turn right around and glorify me. We were made to glorify God. Every one of us. That's our purpose. I struggle long and hard. Turn over to Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 21. If thine in your life is not intentionally lived, bring glory and honor to God, what I'm about to read you is going to be tough. Because these are plagues of not walking with God and not honoring God and touch every one of us in some way. But here's what I want you to get. In those verses are different things that have touched, is touching, or either have a hold on all of our life in one, one degree or another. The question is, do you want to change that? Because the effect of me not honoring God and upholding justice and the love of God, my life not glorifying God before I take care of my family and my friends. You know, Scripture says, if you won't follow me, you got to hate your mother and your father and your brother and sister. And yes, even your own life. Why does he say that? Because we got to come to a place in our heart where we want what God wants first. And we're broken through a vessel and we get distracted and all these things confuse us and hurt us. But if you're serious about walking with God, this is what the Scripture says. These are the plagues that plagues. And you're going to see our country. You're going to see the Christian community in these verses. I'm about to read. Some of you is going to see this in your own life. I did. Some of that. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick. Starting verse 21, Romans chapter 1. For although they knew God, think about that now. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking become futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. In exchange for the glory of the immortal God, they, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men, birds, reptiles, animals. Therefore, God gave them over. My God took his hand off of them. Well, men you're living in sin, God can't bless that. You've got to get back out of your way. You can't bring the darkness into the light. It's all through the Scripture. Therefore, God gave them over into their sinful desires of their heart 
to sexual impurity. For the degrading of their bodies one to another. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. Here's what we do. When we don't want to stand to God, we take that truth and we turn it into a lie where we don't have to bend. We just bend the word. We bend the truth. We alter it. We compromise. And we make it suit our life. Therefore, we don't have to change. It's a lie. That's what it is right here. They exchange the truth of, of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchange natural relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandon natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Y'all know what that is. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves due plenty for their perversion. If you feel like you got a curse on your life, if you feel like God ain't blessing you, go to this Word. Open your heart to God. Get yourself to where you want to glorify God and He'll show you all these things. Some of you thinking right now, well, I ain't got no problem with all that right there. This is for you. Verse 28. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, what is returning the knowledge of God? Is come to church on Sunday and hear a preacher, right? Absolutely not. It's about getting in this word, studying this word, applying it to your life. He says, Therefore, since they did not think it worthy to retain the knowledge of God, He gave them over to a deprived mind to do what ought not to be done. God allows us free will. They become filled with every kind of wickedness. Now, some of you ain't going to think this is wicked, but everything that I'm about to tell you is wickedness. Listen to this. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, isolated, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing it evil, evil. Disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Verse 32, we're going to finish. All they knew, although they knew God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve this. They not only continue to do these very things, but also the proof of those who practice it. It's time to stop making excuses. It is time to stop condoning what the Bible calls sin. It's time that me and you stop making God's Word into a mockery by preaching one thing out of our mouth, making rules like the Pharisees, but not giving the heart. It's time that me and you stop, uh, in our realm of influence, living one way, preaching another. It's, it's time that we grab a hold to it. The very character that we have, that we protect, that we try to make out to be something that ain't, it's time we took a hold of that and said, okay God, where am I today? And what have I got to do to bring honor and glory to your name? What has to change in my life? What do I have to take out and get rid of? What mindset do I have to change to where I can get to a place where I want to bring glory to God in my walk as a Christian more than I do anything else? Because I'm telling you right now, if God has convicted your heart this morning of either one of these things I just read to you, you got work to do. And there ain't one of us that ain't got some work to do to myself. Are you who you say? Are you a stumbling block to other people? Because it's easier just to offer God's word to every life you want. I'm going to leave you for this quick little story. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was king over all the land. He had power over everything, everybody, everywhere, all the time. And he refused to bow down to God. Some of you this morning don't think you're refusing to bow down to God, but you are. You're refusing to be that part of your life so God can be glorified. 
you refuse to give up that stinking, stupid pride that separates you from the love of God because you don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. And you don't want your family mad at you. You don't want your friend to be, or you don't want to be an outcast in this realm of influence, whether it's a, uh, a, 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 an event, a group, a family, whatever. We don't want to bend our knee to God and give Him good praise. We don't want to bend our life to bring glory to God, so we just keep on keeping on. We keep hitting high spots, fitting in the box here, twisting it there when we can. And we wonder why we look like Nebuchadnezzar. What did Nebuchadnezzar look like? This is what he looked like. He refused to bend his knee to God, so God put feathers on him, hair on his back like feathers in the cloth. And he put him out there in the field eating like a cow. Put his nose to the ground, getting ant bit, flies flapping. You ever seen a cow grazing? And we got a basically frustrated career. Slapping the tail, throwing the slobber everywhere, flies just kill him. After they just do that. Now some of you are taking this point, well I don't look nothing like that. Oh, but you do. And here's how you do. When you can't get peace with God, when you squat and flies, frustrated with life, and everything seems to be coming down on you, nothing in your life seems to be going right. That's one thing you call that. Well, maybe Either you don't belong to God, or you need to bend in your knee. Bend your knee to God. It means, God, I'm going to live my life for you. Whatever's in my life, you show it to me. And today, I'm, I'm going to bring glory to you. Every how you do it, every how simple, behind the scenes, life notes, every how you want to do it, every how you want to use me, God, today I'm going to bend my life to the truth of that word, I'm going to practice righteousness. And I'm going to let you use me to change other people. I ain't going to be a stuff in love. It's what Nebuchadnezzar did. I like this story because a lot of times it reminds me. I'll get out there grazing, squatting flies. And all the time, I don't think I've turned my back on God. But I'm not putting my knee on something God told me. you got to get that out of your life, boy. I said, well, you know, I've got to get that back. So here's what it does to me. It puts me out there grazing. Squatting flies, aggravated, frustrated. This part of my life ain't going good. This part causes fear. This part causes anger. This is what Nebuchadnezzar done. If you go back and read that, Daniel chapter 4, he just looked up. It don't say he made no big lofty flare. He didn't build no altar and burn no, no shrine. He looked up. And that tells me he come to a place in his heart when he said, You are God. You can do with me what you want to do. I'm asking you to use me. Listen, listen to what he said. He said, I looked up and my sanity was restored. How many of you need a little sanity restored this morning? Look up. I'm not talking about look up and say, Lord, fix this problem. I'm talking about come to a place in your heart where you say, God, that ain't nothing but you. That's it. That's the day nothing else. And I'm looking at you because I know you can heal me and I know you can put me on the path of righteousness and I know you can put me in a place where I can be a blessing to others and bring glory to you. Nebuchadnezzar said, I looked up and I regained my sanity. It was restored. And I praised the Most High God. And I honored and glorified His name. Where are you at this morning? Are you who you say you are? What's in your life this morning that's stopping you from the all powerful God, His love, His grace, His mercy? Some of you this morning need salvation. You've never been that knee the first time to say, God, I know your son is on the way to heaven. And today I want to give you my life. Some of you bent that knee. You got papers on you, but you look like an athlete out there living. You're in the wrong pastor, doing the wrong thing with the wrong people, bending God's word, bending God's truth. And all it's doing is just heaping down the devil's curse on you. Like Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to live like that swapping flies. All we got to do is look up in our hearts and say, God, I'm yours. What's got to change in your heart today? What well, you can do who God created you to Walking with the same. Let's pray. God, I just praise you, Lord, for your word and your words, Lord. It don't belong to no man. It belongs to you. And God, just like myself, I know there's other people in here just like me stumbling, sometimes being a stumbling block. God, we bend your word. We don't uphold your justice and we don't pass on the love of God because of pride and ignorance and selfishness and self-centeredness. Father, we hate to admit that all those things that I just read in your word plague our life. Some of them like plague our life. Some of them is more than just one or two. God, I just ask this morning that you touch our hearts. If there's somebody here that don't know you, I pray that they'll be a day of salvation. 
And for, for those of us that find ourselves like Nebuchadnezzar out there grazing, knocking ants off our nose, and kicking and squatting flies, waiting on you to change our life, show us what that next step is. Give us the courage to make it, God, so that we will look to heaven with all our heart and say, You are done. Christ name,